بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفع نفوسنا أب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيم ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uthman bin Sa'id occupies a prominent position in Islamic history. As being known as the first of the Safirs or the first of the deputies of Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Sadly, you find very little is discussed in relation to this personality. Indeed, if you were to ask many people about the minor occultation as it is known, Ghaybat al Sughra or Ghaybat al Sagheera or Ghaybat al Qusra, you'll find that very few people actually know what took place in that period. Many of us, when we learn about the 12th Imam, normally learn that he went into Ghayba, and we take a sudden jump all the way till the 21st century. But it can't have been that easy at the beginning of the Ghayba for his followers on the one hand, and indeed for even those who differed with the very conception of Imamat, in the sense that when the 12th Imam went into Ghayba, you find that without a doubt that was a period of intense confusion. That was a period of confusion because for the first time within the history of the school of Ahlul Bayt, the Shia were now in a position where they were wondering who do we go to in order to speak to the Imam. As in, in reality, the other Imams of Ahlul Bayt may have been present but in prison, present but in a different country, but now there was no doubt that this particular Imam is in Ghayba. Now who do you go to when you need to, for example, give your khums? In the past you'd know who to go to. Now there is some sort of confusion. Who do you go to for your religious affairs generally? Your religious questions generally? How are you able to reach the Imam in that particular period of time? That period is known as the period of the Hira, the period of utter confusion. Because without a doubt, there was a great confusion within the followers of Ahlul Bayt. And indeed, there was a sense of apprehension even within the Abbasids at the time. Because they knew that the Qa'im, the Mahdi, was given the title as being the man whose role is what? Izalat al-Duwal. He is the man whose role it is to remove the oppressive governments. Yes? The Abbasids therefore were apprehensive. Where is he gone? What is the situation with him? Is he dead? Is he alive? And even more confusion was caused by the fact 
that Imam al Askari had bequeathed his estate and his property to his mother, Hudayf. Yes? We know within Islamic laws of inheritance, if you leave a mother behind as a deceased, and a son, and a brother, the brother gets nothing. It's all, yes, the mother is the one who will receive. You therefore find that when the Imam had written his will, he hadn't mentioned anything about the Mahdi. Therefore, you found for the Abbasids, this was a bit confusing. Some of the Shia are saying that they believe in the Mahdi. But the Askari in his will has written absolutely nothing about the Mahdi. He has written that his property will go towards his mother, who was still alive at the time, by the name of Hudayf, the wife of our 10th Imam. Therefore, you had the Abbasids were in a state of bewilderment, in a state of confusion. You had the Shia at the time. If you weren't one of the known of the Shia, then you weren't certain where to go. Yes, you weren't necessarily certain who to go to in the absence of the Imam. Yes, some people imagine 12th Imam went to Dhaibah and everyone lived happily ever after. No way, it's not as easy as that. The Shia at the time, let's say there were some Shia who were the close ones to the Imams. Yes, let's say, for example, Ahmed bin Ishaq, let's say Abu Hashim al Ja'fari. Let's say, for example, Ahmed bin Hilal. Let's say Ali bin Bilal. Let's say these were the close ones to whom? To Imam al Askari alayhi salam. These were of the 40 who were told, This is the Hujjah who's going to be after me. How about if you weren't one of them? Yes? How about if you were someone living in Baghdad or someone living in Qum? How would you know who to go to? The Imam is not around. And now also on top of that, you're uncertain about an issue. Is he going to reappear soon or not? Do we remain secretive about him or not? Do we come public about him or not? In other words, some were thinking, what? That he's going to return very shortly. Others were thinking, no, this could be a prolonged absence. And now on top of that, even amongst them, they started having debates who's a muqassar and who's not. Yes? Amongst that early group of Shia, some had debates depending on how you spoke about the Imam. If you spoke about the Imam in one particular way, you may be called a muqassar. You've not appreciated what the Imam really is. And then all of a sudden, the parameters of ghulu, extremism within Shiism, were now under question, were now under threat. As in, who is the Nusari? Because the Nusaris, that name is taken in some opinions from a personality who lived at that time. Then you had Ali bin Hasaka and his like, who started saying the Imams aren't humans. They are Allah on earth. Now you had this period was confusing as you'd see. As in, I'm not surprised Ibn Babaway, when he wrote his book, Al-Imama, wa tabsara min al hira when Ibn Babaway wrote his book about the need for us to emerge from this sense of confusion, that was an extremely difficult time. As in, imagine all of you now, the Imam is with us, all of a sudden he's gone. What do we do? I said, who do we go to? Yes, today someone might say, you go to the ulama. Okay, well, how about in those days? Ulama, okay, after an evolved understanding of the ghaybah, we went towards those who have known the traditions of Ahl al-Bayt, yes? But in that time, can you imagine yourself as a Shia at that time? As in, can you imagine, all of a sudden, Allah has made sure, like when his prophet was about to be killed, on the night of Hijrah, Allah didn't allow them to see him. Likewise, he done it with that prophet's grandson. Now you as a Shia are wondering, who do I go to? Who do I refer to? If you ask many of the Shia in the world, what are the names of the four Safirs of the 12th Imam? I guarantee you there are many who don't know. I'm telling you, yes? The same Shia who tell you, Allahumma kulli waliyik al-hujjat ibn al-hasan, salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai, fi hadhi al-sa'a wa fi kulli sa'a. Ask them, tell me about the four safirs of the Imam. Tell me their names. No one's going to tell you Uthman bin Sa'id, or Muhammad bin Uthman, or Hussein bin Rawh, or they're not going to tell you Ali bin Muhammad, yes? And that goes to show that we haven't appreciated the amount of confusion and difficulty that occurred in that period of the minor ghaybah. Now the sources don't necessarily help us as well, yes? Because firstly, you had certain great books written about these four sufara of the 12th Imam, about these four naibs of the 12th Imam, these four wukala. 
But sadly, many of these books, only fragments of them, if we're lucky, remain. Al-Katib's book on Abi Amr and Abi Ja'far al-Umarin or al amriyin that one where he examines the akhbar on the two of them, the father, the son, that book we don't have with us today. Al-Kitab al-Akhbar, yes, fil wukala al-Arba'a, the book that examines the four deputies of the 12th Imam, that book we don't have with us as well today. Yes, we have, for example, Kitab al-Tanbih of al nawbakhti You've got Al-Ash'ari's Maqalat, which I still believe is useful in this discussion. That's with us. Of course, Tusi, Na'mani, and Saduq's works are with us. So now when someone wants to study the four deputies of the 12th Imam, I guarantee you that there are many who don't know about them. Yes, many don't know who the four deputies are, what's their names. And this is something that has to change. Why? Because this is a theological and a socio-political discussion. Yes, it's not just theology that we're talking about. The whole socio-political discussion of the evolution of Shi'ism in the absence of the 12th Imam begins here. Me, you, and everybody else who's listening to this, yes? I had discussed in the previous 13 Majalis the first 300 years of Shi'ism. Do you agree? Most Shi'a only know of the first 300 years. Ask a Shi'a, what happened after 12th Imam when Zuhayba? What happened? Who are the Boyids? Who are the Seljuks? Who are the Fatimids? Who are the Ottomans? Who are the Safawids? Who are the Ilkanids? Who are the Mamluks? Many of us have neglected a thousand years of our history. You might hear the odd fragment talking about Alam al Hilli or Shahid al Thani or Alam al Majlisi. Other than that, most don't know what took place. And our vital understanding of theology and socio political thought in Shiism begins when the 12th Imam goes into Ghaibah. As soon as the 12th Imam goes into Ghaibah, you're going to see, you know, all the wars you see within Shi'ism today? He's a Muqassar, and he's a La'nati, and he's a Nusari, and he's an Akhbari, and he's an Usuli, and he's a... All of these occur in this period, yes? Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to do what those early followers were doing. We were trying to understand what's our position in the absence of the 12th Imam, yes? As in when we say in dua of Tata, Allahumma inna nashku ilayka faqda nabiyyina wa ghaybata waliyyina. Ya Allah, we complain to you that we don't have our prophet and our imams and ghaybah. Do you know what you mean when you say that? You're saying, oh Allah, I, since the 12th went into ghaybah, I've just been struggling to keep afloat. Yes? I'm swimming, but I'm sinking every day. Because in the absence of the 12th Imam, when we say, Ayn al Hassan, Ayn al Hussein, Ayn Abna al Hussein, when we say that, if you mean it from your heart, do you know what you are saying? You're saying, Oh Allah, when you took the 12th from us, it was a period of confusion for us. We didn't know what we were meant to do, yes? In other words, as soon as the 12th Imam went on that ghaiba, the reason that period was called Al Hira was because there are many of the Shia at that time didn't know what's the next step. Is he coming back tomorrow? Is he coming back next year? Is he coming back next month? Someone says, but you said Imam al-Sadiq said there will be two ghaybas, so many of them should know. No, not everybody reads what Imam al-Sadiq had left behind for them at that time. Number one. Number two, it's a pressure situation. The Abbasids are putting pressure on you as a Shia community. You can't even come out and say you're knowledgeable. Some of you are selling cotton. Some are selling butter just to remain Shia and not reveal yourself. In other words, the period of the first deputy, Uthman bin Sa'id, was without a doubt one of the most difficult periods within the history of Shiism. Yes, 12th Imam has gone to Ghaibah. What happened? Let's examine tonight what happened. In order that we know what was going on, and all I'm going to examine tonight, just the first deputy, not all four, yes? Just the first one. So you know what schisms occurred just for the first of the wukala of the 12th Imam, Uthman bin Sa'id. Let's examine tonight in the following stages. Number one, why is it that the Sunni ulama of that time said that Imam al-Askari had no son? And what is this rumor that is always mentioned that the Imam is hiding in a cellar in Samarra? Number two, what, who, what was the background of Uthman bin Sa'id? 
which imams had he served and what attributes did he have that made him wakil of imam number three what was the way he had shown his credibility early on number four what was the schism that he faced with imam al-askari's brother jafar who claimed that he deserved the imama number five how did he deal with the hulat who said the imams are god and how was that particularly troublesome throughout the minor occultation and number six what did the 12th imam communicate with him to communicate to his shia at that time and what were the issues that were arising that even made some qummi suspicious of his position let's examine this in order that we understand the delicacy of that period firstly someone asked the question we're saying the 12th imams in ghaybah how comes the sunni ulama of that time say there was no 12th imam yes as in if you read al-balkhi who was living at that time he says there's no 12th imam shahristani later on ibn hazm later on Zahabi later on ibn khaldun later on all of them say there was no 12th imam someone says why did they not think there was a 12th imam and why would they later on someone like the Habi says if there is they say he's in a cellar somewhere under the ground yes first and foremost the fact that imam al-askari hadn't written 12th imam's name in his will was a reason why many of the sunni ulama thought 12th imam is not born yes someone asks why didn't he write the 12th imam's name in his will what do you want the abbasis to come and massacre the 12th imam or what yes as an if Imam al Askari writes the 12th Imam's name in his will, the Abbasids won't rest on their laurels and think the 12th Imam's not there. Yes? If they see the wasiyah of the Imam, then when they see that wasiyah, they're going to realize hold on, if the Mahdi's name is written, that means we should still survey that area of Samarra. We should still keep an eye out. Anytime we get a hint, there may be a young boy will go and massacre him. Imam al Askari, therefore, wouldn't write that. Why? Because he wanted to make sure that the Abbasids would not continue to put pressure as much as they were putting on the Shia, yes? When someone like Balkhi or someone like Shahristani or Ibn Hazm says there's no 12th Imam, I agree with them in the sense that, yes, you're right. If you're telling me about a wasiyah, public will to everybody saying that the Imam after me is the Mahdi, you're not going to get that, yes? Imam al-Askari knows these people have been trying to kill him and his family all this time he's not going to write in his will my son al-mahdi yes yes imam al-askari will get 40 of his closest shia people like ahmed bin hilal people like ali bin bilal people like uthman bin saeed he'll gather them he'll sit with them he'll tell them about the imam but they said something very clear in the early days of the ghayba never mention his name never mention his whereabouts why if someone now who knows 12th Imams alive says, Hey, I just saw uh, Muhammad al Mahdi, yes? Everyone will straight away hear the whispers and look for the Imam, yes? Even in those early days, you couldn't say 12th Imam's name. You have a secret title for the 12th Imam Baqiyatullah, Al Qa'im, Al Hujjah, yes. And even Al Qa'im, remember, they had known, the Abbasids had known, Al Qa'im, his role is what? Izalat al Dual. His role is going to be that he removes these governments. So even that title, you have to be wary about. Someone says, so where did they get this idea that the 12th Imam is in a cellar somewhere? I said, you wouldn't believe how many YouTube videos I've seen where you've got these uh, Salafi preachers, yes, on YouTube. Oh, these Shia believe their Imam is hiding in an underground cave or in a cellar in Samarra. That's not our books, my dear brothers, yes? That's Dhabi, that's Ibn Khaldun, that's yours, not mine. Uh, you want to look at who mentions this go towards the fifth even sixth seventh century is when these first rumors came out the 12th imam is hiding in a cave in samarra yes they say but you people go to samarra every year and you want to touch that area you call it sardab no we talk about that area as the area where 11th imam died naturally when the janaza of the imam and the salah is going to be led it was going to be led in that area yes it doesn't mean 12th Imam is living in a cave or in a cellar in Samarra, yes? And Dhabi, Ibn Khaldun aren't nothing to do with my school. They're not my ulama. They mention the cellar 
they mention this, that's got nothing to do with me. Of course, that doesn't deny that there were Sunni ulama who mentioned that the Shia were believing in the 12th Imam being born. Al-Ash'ari within the Maqalat, and Al-Ash'ari wrote the Maqalat just after, as it was living in the time of the second occultation, of the greater occultation, he wrote the, within the Maqalat that the Shia believe in a son of the 12th Imam, known as Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Askari, yes? But the majority of the Sunni ulama, no, they don't believe it because they believe every Imam would have left a will as to the Imam after him. So they were asking the fact that Imam al-Askari didn't leave a will, it meant that Imam al-Askari had no successor. No, Imam al-Askari didn't leave a will because you have to be careful with these debates. Your son comes and brings you this argument that dad, every Imam, when he dies, he leaves his will. He says who the Imam is after. How comes Imam al-Askari? No, Imam al-Askari did. But what did Imam al-Askari do? Firstly, he made it clear. This is the Hujjah. 40 people saw the Hujjah from his close companions. Secondly, what did the Imam do? He said, but now, when the Hujjah appears, yes? If you want to communicate with the Hujjah, you go through Uthman bin Sa'id. Yes? If you want to communicate with the Hujjah, who do you go through? Uthman bin Sa'id. The first Safir of the 12th Imam, Uthman bin Sa'id. Someone asked this question. Why was Uthman bin Sa'id chosen as the first Safir? Yes? Why? What is Uthman bin Sa'id? Is he the greatest alim of his time? I don't think so. I'm willing to discuss with anyone the fact that there could have been greater companions of Imam al-Askari alive at that time who in knowledge. Yes? Is knowledge the main criteria for you to be wakil of an Imam? What if you're knowledgeable and you have no admin skills? What if you're knowledgeable but a person of nepotism? What if you're knowledgeable and you don't know how to talk to people? What if you know the whole world of fiqh, 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 but you've got no social skills when talking to the masses? When the 12th Imam's first wakil was appointed, why didn't the 12th Imam appoint from his family, for example? Yes, Imam al Askar, his brother Ja'far is alive. First condition of a wakil. The more family members you bring in, the more chance of corruption within. You can easily bring Ja'far, the brother of the Imam. No. We bring Uthman bin Sa'id. Why? Because he served the 10th Imam and he served the 11th Imam. Yes? When he served, some even say he served the 9th Imam when he was 11 years old. People have a doubt about that. But definitely, Uthman bin Sa'id was a servant do you know what servant means in the house of 10th and 11th Imam? Someone who serves water. Someone who's a gatekeeper. Someone who's a chamberlain. The wakil of the 12th Imam. First one used to be a gatekeeper and chamberlain. What did the Imams look for in their representative? Family? Nah. Imams of Ahlul Bayt don't put family as their reps. Big trouble when you start putting in-laws as your reps. Big trouble. The most knowledgeable? Not really. Because you can be really knowledgeable but not sociable. The most knowledgeable? But you can be very knowledgeable but have no admin skills. Your whole infrastructure is a mess. First criteria of deputy of the 12th Imam. Number one, thiqa, reliable. Number two, ameen, trustworthy. Never do you see alim, a'alam. Thiqa, ameen. Uthman bin Sa'id, what was he? He had thiqa. Reliability in the way he does his work. And he was trustworthy. Whenever the 12th Imam talks about him, he says, Uthman bin Sa'id. Thiqa and Amin. Reliable, trustworthy. Not a member of our family, because we don't want a system where the 12th Imam's rep 
is father, son, son-in-law, brother-in-law, cousin-in-law, uncle-in-law, auntie-in-law, uncle-in-law, brother-in-law, son-in-law, son-in-law, son-in-law. This is history, as in either I learn from my 12th Imam or I don't learn. Yes? First condition, thiqa. Second condition, reliable. Third condition, someone who can meet the people, talk to them. Because he's the rep of the Imam, yes? So he has to be the middleman between the Shia and the Imam. He's not the middleman between the rich and the Imam. Hmm. You can't be the middleman between the rich and the imam. Yes? A middleman with every Shi'i. The poor Shi'i, the rich Shi'i, the multi millionaire Shi'i, and the very basic of the Shi'a. You're the middleman between them, yes? You're a wakil. Wakil doesn't mean I sit in fancy banquets with the rich of the Shi'a, yes? Wakil, what does it mean? It means that I represent the Imam towards the Shia. Yes? He had that ability, his social skills. In other words, when Uthman bin Sa'id was representing the 12th Imam, Uthman bin Sa'id, first criteria, reliable. Second criteria, trustworthy. Third criteria was what? Not family. Don't put family. Yes? Family, recipe for disaster. Yes? Put someone outside of the family, yes? Number four, someone who knows how to talk with everyone amongst the Shia, yes? And that's what he did. From the beginning, he had the ability to communicate with everybody amongst the Shia. He knew what an Imam wanted. Even when he used to work for Imam al-Askari, yes? Because you know how he begins. Basic with Imam al-Hadi. Then with Imam al-Askari, he graduates until he becomes the rep of the 12th Imam. With Imam al-Askari, he would sniff something from far away, yes? I remember when, uh, when one of the companions of the Imam, one of the companions of the Imam was bringing some money, and he wanted to give it to a person called Faris bin Hatim, yes? A companion of the Imam by the name of Ali, wanted to bring some money to the Imam through Faris bin Hatim. Uthman bin Sa'id knew the Imam had done la'na on Faris bin Hatim. That person didn't know. As soon as he was going to go to Faris, Uthman jumped in and said, Hey, bring the money over here. Let me direct it. Why? Because Uthman didn't just sit with the rich of the Shia world. Yes? Uthman sat with everybody. The politicians, the low class, the high class, the ones with the big account, the one with the small account. He sat with all of them, so he knew everything that was going on. Therefore, when the Imam employed him, number one, thiqa, number two, ameen, number three, sociable, number four, not in a world of nepotism, yes, but still, he faced a major challenge. What was the first challenge Uthman bin Sa'id faced? Imam al-Askari is a brother, the 12th Imam's uncle was alive, yes? Imam al-Askari's brother Ja'far said, I am the Imam after the 12th Imam. You know, this Ja'far for seven years took the mother of Imam al-Askari to court, battling with her about the estate of Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. Someone says, but how? He's the brother of an Imam. I don't care. You can have a Qabil and you can have a Habil, Yes. You can have Yusuf and you can have his brothers, yes? There are many instances in Islamic history where you're able to have one good apple and one bad apple from the same family, yes? Ja'far, brother of Imam al-Askari, who used to give the hardest time to Uthman bin Sa'id when he became deputy, yes? Ja'far was the one who wanted to lead Salah when the Imam died. He was envious of the fact that Uthman bin Sa'id had organized the whole janazah and all the prayer functions and congregations for the 11th Imam when he died. There was a battle between the two of them. And even when the 11th Imam had left behind his estate, 11th Imam had left behind the estate to his mother, Hudayf, you found that this Ja'far took his own, yes, took the mother. Seven year court battle over that piece of land, yes. Paying money under the table to Bani Abba. You're a brother of an Imam of Al Muhammad. Yes? Doesn't matter. You can be in the purest household and you could still come out as an Abu Lahab. Yes? It can happen. That Ja'far would take them. The judge would say, hold on. If the Imam has left uh, his mom, he has left a son, and he has left a brother in Shia fiqh, 
the, the brother gets nothing. Yes? Because the mother is there. Yes? He battled with the mother until eventually they had to share half of the estate. Then he would battle. He would say to the Abbas, it's keep an eye out on the house. I'm telling you that boy is alive. Yes? In some cases he'd tell people, no, he's not alive. This is all a myth. In other cases he'd tell people, no, he is alive. Go and have a good search out for him. Uthman bin Sa'id and the Shia at the beginning, their biggest enemy in the beginning was who? The biggest difficulty they faced in the beginning was Imam al Askari's brother Ja'far. Yes? That Ja'far would cause a nuisance to all of them. He'd cause trouble to all of them. Subhanallah. Maybe that's why the 12th Imam made sure that his wakil was not from his family. Yes? Because when you put a wakil from your family, one brother-in-law fights another brother-in-law, one brother-in-law hates another brother-in-law. Why? Because you're all chasing the top account. So you want to make sure that you get ahead of someone else. Yes? It happens. As in you can imagine, the 12th Imam did not want this to happen where families were controlling the deputyship of the Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. Yes? It should be anyone who is a thiqa, anyone who is Amin. Therefore, that Ja'far would not stop causing trouble to Uthman bin Sa'id, yes? But what brought that Ja'far down? Many hadiths mention about the fact that he used to be someone who was in the illicit gatherings, you know, drunkenness with the slave girls as well. Allahu A'lam, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best judge of these things. But they told Uthman bin Sa'id, get us a proof from the 12th Imam, if you are his wakil, about Ja'far. When he got it, it's narrated within Bihar and Anwar of Majlisi. We call them Tawqi'at, letters from the 12th Imam given to certain people, either naibs of the 12th Imam or, or the ordinary. As in, I remember Sheikh al Saduq mentions 13 agents were getting communication from 12th Imam and 46 of the ordinary below the agents were getting communication from the 12th Imam. 12th Imam said, Who is this person? who claims to be the Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. He doesn't know, listen to what he says about Ja'far, his uncle. He doesn't know the, the prohibition and what is allowed. He doesn't know the muhkam and the mutashabah of the Quran. He doesn't know the rules about salah and so on. So he said, this person for 40 days hasn't even prayed salah. Yes. And if he truly claims to be an Imam of Ahl al-Bayt, let him provide a mu'jizah from himself. Yes? If he claims to be an Imam and that he should be the head of the Shia, let him put a mu'jizah. In other words, Uthman bin Sa'id was the one who was the communicator between the Shia and the 12th Imam in that period. Yes? Because the Shia were confused. Ja'far, brother of Imam al-Askari, that means his surname is big, he's from the line of the Imams, surely that means he has a good claim? 12th Imam wrote in the letter to Uthman bin Sa'id, tell the Shia, this uncle of mine, no salah, 40 days he hasn't prayed, doesn't know laws of salah, doesn't know laws of Quran, what's the muhkam, what's the mutashabah? You found the Shia when they received this from Uthman bin Sa'id, were confident. Okay, problem number one was solved. But still there were other Shia and Qum who were not certain and others in Baghdad who were not certain that Uthman bin Sa'id deserves to be the Naib of the Imam. Why? Because they said surely the Imam would provide us with a sign that this person knows things more than anyone else if he has chosen him as the Naib. Yes? There must be something. And I remember Hassan ibn Nadhar or ibn Nadhar was sitting down with Abu al-Saddam. Yes? Abu Saddam and Hassan bin Nadr were sitting down with each other. When they were sitting down with each other, Hassan bin Nadr said, Are you sure about Uthman bin Sa'id that he talks with the 12th Imam? I said to him, Why? He said, Because surely there'd be something that he would do that would show us that the 12th Imam is guiding him. Yes? So he looked at him and he said to him, Well, you know what? They say that he's the Naib of the 12th Imam. And every one of the particular hierarchy of the Shia believes he's the wakil of the 12th Imam. So you know what he said? He said, turn around. Hassan turned around. He said, you know what? I'm going to go hajj this year. Abu Saddam said to him, listen, postpone hajj for a year. He said, no, no, I want to go. I saw a dream and it's made me really frightened. I'm going to go to hajj this year. Something's going to go wrong in my life. He met Ahmed bin Hamad. When he met Ahmed bin Hamad, Ahmed said to him, where are you going? He said, I want to go hajj. I've got some money that I want to also send towards the 12th Imam. Ahmed said, I'm sending money towards the 12th Imam. Don't worry about going Hajj this year. Yes? 
This Hassan was wondering, why is everyone telling me not to go Hajj this year? What's going on? He said, I was in Baghdad. All of a sudden, someone came to my house. He said, are you Hassan? He said, yes. He said, here's some clothing. Here's some food. And then you're going to have to go towards Al Askar, Samarra. Yes? You go to Samarra, there'll be someone waiting for you. He said, I was wondering, what's going on? This guy walked into my house, gave me some things. I picked up the things. I went to Al Askar. When I got there, someone came up to me. Are you Hassan? I said, yes. He said, come into this house. There was a black slave in the house. He walked us in. He said, behind the curtain, I hear a man telling me, do not have the confusions which shaitan brings upon you about me being the wakil. Yes? He said, at that moment, I knew. And then he said to me, here are two pieces of clothing. You're going to need them very soon. Subhanallah, they were two kafans which he would need in a few months because he was going to die. Yes? That person, Hassan, why did he need to be certain about Uthman bin Sa'id? Why? Because A, many people could claim they are the na'ib of Imam. Yes, many could say. Imagine someone just stands up now and says, I am the na'ib. Another says, I'm the na'ib. Another says, I'm the na'ib. No. He said, Ya Allah, show me a sign. And I think the Imam showed him a sign. Why? Because he represented the people of Qum at the time. Had the people of Qum had a doubt about the 12th Imam, you would have lost many of the Shia of Qum at that time. Likewise, at that time, there were doubts. The Ismailis were coming to try and make the Ithna Asharis. Yes. Make the Ithna Ashari, and some say this term Ithna Ashari only came a hundred years after the Ghaibah. Well, say the Ismailis came to try and convert the Rafidis, yes, at that time. If you want to say what the Zaydis would call us, like Al Qasim bin Ibrahim, the point was what? The point was that that Hassan from Qum was convinced, yes. Uthman bin Sa'id is the first wakil of the 12th Imam, he had his own experience, he went back where. He went back towards Qum, told the people of Qum. But then there was another group who emerged, who gave this man a problem. Who were they? And they gave problems to all the other three of the Sufara. They were those who used to say that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are God on earth. Yes? They were people who used to say the Imams are God. And amongst them was a leader by the name of Ali bin Hasaka. Yes? Ali bin Hasaka. He used to say, and I remember Sahel bin Ziyad. Sahel bin Ziyad went to who? He went to the 11th Imam. He said, Ali bin Hasaka says, please bear with us on this discussion. Ali bin Hasaka says what? Ali bin Hasaka says that the Imams are divine and he is the Naib of the Imams. Yes? And that once you have Ma'rifa of Imams, there's no need for Salah, no need for Hajj, no need for Zakah. Yes. Some things don't change, by the way. Until today, you have Shia who say this. Yes, until today, you have Shia who say, if you know the Imam, no need for Salah. Yes. I remember someone telling me there's a group of Shia who say that you shouldn't pray because Ali ibn Abi Talib was killed in his prayer. We don't need any more Shia to each other. If we can distill some and kick them out, it would be good for the Shia. Yes. Ali bin Hasaka used to say that Imams are God and that he's naive of the Imam. And once you have ma'rif of the Imams, yes? These were causing problem for Uthman bin Sa'id. Why? They would go around telling people, listen, the Imams are God and that we are naib of the Imams. And I remember Imam al-Askari tell, telling Sahel, la'na on these people who say that we are God. Hajj, Zakat, all of these are obligatory upon us, yes? And then he further went on to say, we have only preached monotheism and nothing else. Yes? These Yaqtini and Sharmi and all these people who were coming out saying that the Imams were God. And there were a few. Now, when we go to the other wakils of the Imams, when you go to Muhammad bin Uthman or Hussein bin Rawh in Nawbakhti, yes? You'll see the emergence of Hallaj and Shalmaghani and others. In other words, what did you find? You find that that was the third problem that he faced. Yes? The problem of the Shia who were the Ghulad? Now someone says, can you define Ghulad? No, you can't. As in, realistically, the parameters of what it was to be a Ghali was open to the, for debate. Yes? They were certainly open for debate at that time. Because you had the Mufawwidah were emerging, the Khattabiyah were on the side. Those who came from a Qummi school or a Baghdadi school were to emerge in their understanding of the Imams. Either as mystical figures or a rational understanding of the Imams, 
These debates were going to continue. So the parameters of what it meant to be a ghali, there's been a difference of opinion on this and would continue once the boyids would come into power. But the point was what? The point was Uthman bin Sa'id in the early days, even before he left Samarra to live in Karakh towards Baghdad, he faced problems from the brother of the Imam who gave him much problems, Ja'far, yes? And then he faced problems from the Ghulat and the Nusairis. That was the second people he faced problem with. He faced problem with the Shia who were confused. Is he the Naib of the Imam? Isn't he the Naib? As in without a doubt, this man deserves a lot of respect for how he held Shiism together at that time. Yes? A lot of respect. Why? Because the Shia at that time, there was great confusion. Some of them believed Imams were God. Some left to Shayu. Some made their own sect. Some said Imam al-Askari is the, is the Imam and he's going to come back. Lots of confusion. Who consolidated this? Uthman bin Sa'id held the Shia together. How did he hold the Shia together? By selling butter. It's the irony of this world. Yes. By selling butter. You see, there were three important people in Shiaism at that time. Uthman bin Sa'id in Karakh. And who was the other of the important people? Ahmed bin Ishaq was in Qum. And the third was Muhammad al Gattan. Yes? Where was he? In Baghdad. They used to call Uthman bin Sa'id a Zayyat or a Samman. Why do you think they called him these two names? He used to guide the Shia through selling butter. You can't openly come out to the Shia and say, Imam Mahdi is telling me this and this is what you have to do. You can't give majalis about the 12th Imam, can you? No, you can't. So you know what they used to do? I'm telling you, the whole of the representatives of the 12th Imam and then the representatives of the representatives of the 12th Imam, they would get jobs in the market. One would sell cotton. He sells cotton, he gives you answers over cotton. Normally, someone gives you an answer over a cup of tea, you agree? Or someone gives you an answer over meat. He used to sell cotton. Cotton, yes, cotton. That's why they used to call him Muhammad al Gattan. Oh, oh, Uthman al Sa'id used to call him Uthman al Zayyat. Those who sell olive oil. While he's selling olive oil, he gives you a mas'al of fiqh, he answers it for you. Or he tells you where to take your khums. Or, Muhammad al Gattan, you know what he used to do? When he finished selling cotton, he used to get all the questions of the Shia, put them in a bag of cotton, cover the bag with cotton, and send it towards Uthman bin Sa'id to answer the questions of the Shia. Yes? <coughs> As in these early days of the 12th Imam's Ghaibah were not easy for the Shia. It was shrouded in secrecy. There was an underground organization. Yes? Those who knew Uthman, whether it was Ahmed bin Ashaq, whether it was the Mahziyars, whether it was the Nawbakhtis, whether it was, for example, Muhammad al Gattan, they would try their hardest to serve the Shia and send the messages to the 12th Imam. Yes? And this Uthman bin Sa'id died when? The poor man died a few months after, what? A few years after the 12th Imam. Yes? Those few years, as in his period of being Safir of the 12th Imam was not long, but was extremely important. Yes? That period could have been the period where many Shia stopped being Shia. Because your Imam is gone, you don't know who to refer to, you don't know who to talk to, and you have one side telling you the Imams are God, and another side, Ja'far saying, I am your Imam, I'm his brother. In other words, Uthman went through a turbulent period, but the Imam, when Uthman died, wrote, Inna lillahu wa inna alayhi raji'oon. This Uthman bin Sa'id has been a servant of Ahl al-Bayt, alayhim as -salam. He has worked hard to ensure that the right word was spread. He has struggled in our path, and he has become one of the friends of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt. Yes? In other words, this period of Uthman bin Sa'id is not a period to be glossed over. That period consolidated the Shia until his son Muhammad took over, who we'll come to examine tomorrow night, insha'Allah. You found that this Uthman bin Sa'id 
What was his origin? Some say his origin, he was from Banu Asad, the famous tribe of Kufa, yes? Banu Asad, from them, there were some great personalities, yes? And from them, there were those who didn't turn up to Karbala, sadly, yes? Some people may mention some of the companions of Imam al Hussein are known as Asadi, yes? Some are mentioned as Banu Asad, but sadly, there were a few of these who didn't turn up to Karbala on the 10th of Muharram, yes? Their wives, when the 10th of Muharram finished, their wives, they, Banu Asad used to live between Kufa and Karbala. When the 10th of Muharram finished, their wives said to their husbands, how could you not help the son of Zahra when he was alone, yes? You left him alone on the battlefield in Karbala and you are proud to call yourself Banu Asad? At least do one thing. Go and bury his body now that it lies on the ground alone. Yes? This was when? 11th of Muharram, the wives said this. 12th of Muharram, they got ready. 13th of Muharram, Banu Asad went to Karbala. All of them together. That same 13th of Muharram, Imam Zain al Abideen left Kufa to come back to Karbala. Many times people ask me, Imam al Hussein, was he buried straight away? No, no, no. This dunya is unfair, yes? <coughs> this dunya is unfair. Me and you, we may be buried straight away, yes? The son of Zahra, three nights, his body lay on the ground. Yes, three nights. Banu Asad got to Karbala. From far away, they saw a man whose face was covered coming. They were wondering, who is it? They got scared, so they hid. The man came to them. He said to them, what are you doing here? They said to him, we have just come to look around the bodies. He said to them, no, tell me, what are you doing here? They said to him, we've come to bury the body of Hussein and the family of Hussein. He looked at them, he said to them, so why haven't you buried the bodies? They said, we don't know which body belongs to who. Some of the bodies have no heads on top of them. Some of the bodies have no arms connected to them. Some of the bodies, there are pieces missing from them. And there's a body of a baby on the ground over there, yes? So as soon as he heard this, he said to them, let me advise you how to bury the bodies. Remember, he had not seen Karbala since he left on the 10th of Muharram. The narrations mention, he said, Bani Asad, go and dig three different graves. They went and dug three different graves. He then said to them, place in the first grave the family of my father Hussein. They took the family of Abba Abdullah. They buried them in that first grave. Then he said, the second grave, put Habib ibn Mabahir alone in that grave, yes? Tell me how high is Habib ibn Mabahir that he has his own grave, yes? Then the third grave, put the companions of my father. They placed the companions. He then said, now I'm going to walk towards a body which only I can bury. He began the walk towards the holy body of Abba Abdullah. He hadn't seen the state of Imam al Hussein. Listen to this for a moment, I beg you. When he was approaching the body, there was a finger on the ground. Yes? What was this finger? When Imam al Hussein had been killed, a man came. He wanted to take the ring of Rasulullah. He tried to pull the ring out he couldn't he tried again he couldn't so he chopped the finger of Abu Abdullah the Imam picked up the finger he began to walk towards the body of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam when he got there the body he fell next to the body of Abu Abdullah the next thing he did breaks the heart he turned around he said Bani Hassan 
bring me a prayer mat. Yes. They wondered why. Does Zainal Abidin want to pray? He said to them, No, I want to collect the pieces of my father's body. He began to collect the pieces. As you know, when your father dies, it is sunnah to turn his cheek to the side. Yes. Where was the cheek of Abba Abdullah? It was in Kufa. Yes. The Imam buried the body of Imam al Hussein. When he finished marrying the body, suddenly Banu Asad said something to him. They said to him, Zain al Abidin, he said, Yes. They said, There's one more body by the Furat. Allah. Lovers of Abbas know where I'm going. And they said to him, There's one more body by the Furat. When we leave the right side, the left falls on the ground. When we leave the left side, the right falls on the ground. He began his walk towards the body of Qabr Bani Hashim. And he said, As-salamu alayka, ya Abel al He came, he gathered the body of Abel al Yes. Let me give you this narration. Allama Mahdi Bakhr al-Uloom says, they were reconstructing the Qabr of Abel al Yes. This was a few hundred years ago. They were reconstructing the Qabr of Abel al He says, the builders finished the work. They came to me. They said, Allama, we want to ask you a question. He said, what is it? They said, the ulama say, Abel al when he sat on a horse, his feet would touch the ground. He said, yes, it's true. They said, but Allama, we have a question. He said, what? He said, his grave is so small. Allama began to cry. They said, why are you crying? He said, I wonder how many pieces they chopped the body of Abel al So his body became that small. Inna lillahu wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ya Allah, raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Allow us to be amongst his companions and those who follow his message. Ya Allah, allow us to be amongst those who unite under the banner of Muhammad and al-Muhammad, the originators of this majlis. Bless them with the shafa'ah of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our brothers in Iraq. Ya Allah, remove the oppression that they face. And all of our brothers around the Muslim world, we pray with a surah al-Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Oh, <laughs>